American photographer Lorene Swire longed to see the North, where the wildfowl of her birthplace, Kansas, spent their summers. In 1937, she got her wish. During the summer of that year and into the fall, Squire traveled to various marshlands in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta to photograph the wildfowl that were her passion. With the help of the Hudson's Bay Company, whom she had contacted at their head offices in Winnipeg, Squire was able to draw on the Fur Trade Company's network of contacts and resources to assist with her travels through the northern prairie provinces. It was the beginning of a short but fruitful collaboration with the HBC's flagship magazine, The Beaver. So it began this fruitful collaboration with The Beaver magazine. One that I argue in my larger project on Squire produced the most remarkable images of northern Canadian wildlife of the pre-war period. For the next three years, Squire made a series of trips into the Canadian wilderness, photographing and later publishing the results in several prominent magazines, including as a staff photographer for Life magazine starting in 1938. The photograph she took in the Canadian North before her untimely death in 1942 at the age of 34 included more than just pictures of birds and ducks. Amongst the negatives and prints in the HBC archives are a select few images of the photographer herself. In this paper, I argue that Lorene Squire's wildfowl photography must share its pride of place with another form of image the photographs of Squire herself. These images of a young and modern professional woman posing with her handheld cameras, leaning on the rail of the HBC supply ship, the Nascope, crouching amongst the marsh reeds of the north, and posed alongside a prop engine bush plane, present carefully constructed self-portraits of an independent artist who created images from the frontier of woman's production. What is especially interesting is how these images of the photographer were used alongside her wildlife photographs in many newspaper articles, magazine spreads, and equally in the Beaver magazine. By doing so, I argue that the photo editors, and likely Squire herself, saw these constructed images of a modern girl as a useful commercial tool for selling issues. For Squire, the growing celebrity attached to her image would have helped to legitimize and publicize her career through the consumer language of the popular press. Born in a small town of Harper, Kansas in 1908, Squire began photographing in the mid-1920s, during the decade when the American Midwest dried into a dust bowl, described by filmmaker Ken Burns as, quote, the worst man-made ecological disaster in American history. Squire wrote of her journey to photography in those dry years, when the great plow up, as it came to be known, destroyed the prairie habitat and its underwater aquifers through aggressive monocultural practices. In her photo book, Wildfowling with a Camera, published by J.B. Lippincott Company in 1938, Squire writes of her longing to see the northern breeding grounds of the birds she regularly photographed in her local Kansas law. In the second half, that much anticipated journey to the north is described in an engaging and informal style and supported by a hundred photographs printed in a soft aquatone, which Squire was deeply disappointed by. The account of her travels is punctuated with descriptions of the wildfowl she encountered and the many photographic challenges she faced trying to tell, and I quote her, the life story of wild ducks. In the introductory chapter to what is her only published book, Squire describes how that ecological disaster shaped her photography. And I have an extended quote here. It was about the time that I had begun to learn something concerning the photography of wildfowl that the dry years set in. But by then I had already encountered enough difficulties to be able to accept the Kansas drought with some philosophy. The region in which I live lies upon the edge of the Dust Bowl, along that vague boundary line that marks the beginning of the short grass country. Here, even during the most severe years of drought, 
there still remained a few pools and water holes upon the prairie's face. And here I can photograph the few water birds that returned to these diminished waters. The tone of her account might remind not a few of you of another singular memoir about place by an intrepid female, published a year before Squire's own story, which famously begins, I had a farm in Africa at the foot of the Nagong Hills. These words by the renowned Karen Blixen, a.k.a. Isaac Dinnison, remind us that the interwar period was a time of great freedom and success for women artists of all sorts, a time when the modern girl, a fresh iteration of new womanhood, was becoming a global phenomenon in representation and in fact, from Amelia Earhart to Lenny Reifenstahl to Margaret Burke White. The modern girl presented to the world a contested, performed, and unstable icon of femininity, sexuality, consumerism, and freedom. In her book on, the feminine modernity, on feminine modernity in Canada, Jane Nichols describes the modern girl this way. She consumed goods from clothing to cigarettes and eschewed established visual cues of gender, class, and ethnicity. The modern girl was both a reality and a construction, propelled by advertising, film, and mass media, and the growing female working class who helped to redefine the lives of women in the interwar period. In preparing for this conference, I've been researching not only the images that Squire made for the Beaver magazine, which is my larger project, but also the many newspaper and magazine articles that were written about the photographer herself. The plethora of puff pieces about the Kansas girl photographer who shoots birds with a camera affirms the argument made by members of the Modern Girl Around the World research group that while there were many aesthetic and national variations on the modern girl, nevertheless, quote, by the 1930s, visual representations of women with bobbed hair, cloche hats, elongated bodies, and open, easy smiles could be found on all five continents in a range of visual media. Elizabeth Otto and Vanessa Rocco, in discussing the visual representation of new womanhood, which they see as broadly encompassing modern girlhood, give special credit to film and photography as, quote, media at the border between modernism and mass culture, a space also inhabited by the new woman, who was on the leading edge of art, fashion, and culture, but also had the market-driven appeal of the starlet model or sales girl. Yet it wasn't only the increased representation of the new woman or the modern girl that shaped these shifting and circulating takes on womanhood. The new girl was also behind the camera, influencing, performing, and constructing the very identity being pictured. Jermaine Krull, Hannah Hoch, and Marianne Brandt all warranted a chapter each in Otto and Rocco's book, The New Woman International, as self-aware artists who were themselves sophisticated critics of the mass consumer culture in which the modern girl found her image. They, unlike Squire, belonged to an avant-garde creative class that was likely impossibly foreign to the small town lens woman, whose own studies at the University of Kansas and Wichita State, so Wichita State University exposed her to the pen and scroll society and to this serious group of fine artists and modern girls. Yet a hint of the rattle undercurrent she may have been exposed to at the University of Kansas can be found in this photograph of sorority sisters, members of the Tau Sigma Dance Society, who no doubt offered some exciting entertainment with their Isadora Duncan-style modern dance and dress to their fellow students. Squire graduated with a degree in speech and dramatic arts from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Kansas in 1932, after seven years of on and off enrollment. All the while, she was photographing. With no photography department at U of Kansas, it is likely the Squire was entirely self-taught. In fact, several of the newspaper articles about the girl photographer mention the story of her first camera. In an interview with Victor Murdoch of the Wichita Eagle, Squire describes coming to the camera not through the gallery, but through her failure with the shotgun. As luck would have it, Lorene's father, quote, with an avowed purpose of training her to balance a budget, gave her a year's allowance in one lump sum. She spent the whole of it on an Erneman camera, made in Berlin, which she found in the camera advertisements. 
This camera proved heavy and troublesome, but would lead to her learning about investigating and investing in lighter, faster, and a more appropriate kit. These, this origin story about Squire, published in the Kansas State newspaper, is just one of dozens of regional and national publicity pieces about the bird life artist. Someone like Lorene Squire, an outdoorsy small town girl with a serious passion for feathered fowl, has never been discussed in terms of the urban and cosmopolitan women photographers who have come to be held up as iconic figures of modern girlhood or even the more serious modern woman. To me, the many photographs of Lorene Squire used to illustrate the stories written about her reflect the modern girl ethos, albeit a more rural and less glamorous version. One of the most powerful conclusions of the modern girl around the world research group is that across different contexts, and I quote, the modern girl was distinguished from other female figures and representations by her continual incorporation of local elements with those drawn from elsewhere. Lorene Squire, posing with her camera, her hair bobbed and pinned up, wearing lipstick, a pencil skirt, or sometimes trousers, her shirt freshly pressed or sometimes concealed beneath a Hudson's Bay point blanket coat, but always poised and put together, shows a carefully constructed version of the modern girl professional as both artist and outdoors woman. This is not the vamp or seductress variation of the modern girl, yet they do share something in common. They use their image and bodies in a distinctly modern and commercial way. Probably the most humorous example of the modern girl photographer trope was done by the Beaver magazine. Lorene Squire Photographs, Babes in the North, published in the December 1940 issue of the magazine, is a composite article of photographs that Squire had made while working for the Beaver, images that were for their use only. So they contrived this delightful article made up of pictures of baby animals, and one baby, and a definite babe wearing her Hudson's Bay coat. And what is quite an unusual prose for the magazine, the text announces that, quote, Beaver addicts will doubtlessly be charmed to know that the lady appearing out of the duck blind above is Miss Lorene Squire. On closer inspection, it will be seen that, like another famous woman photographer, Miss Margaret Bourke White, she wears a Hudson Bay point blanket parka. For the benefit of those interested in such details, we might add that while the life photographer favors a multi-stripe model, Vide Harper's Bazaar for March 1st, Miss Squire sports a pine green one with a black stripe, a choice that was undoubtedly made in the interest of camouflage as well as style. This clear use of Squire as a model and advert for the Hudson's Bay coat line, seen here advertised in a double spread from the magazine, shows that while the Beaver valued her as a photographer and contributor to their mag, they nevertheless saw her as a significant commodity. Yet some of the, that, this adventurer version of the modern girl can be seen in photographs of Amelia Earhart, the first woman to cross the Atlantic in a slow little flight. Earhart was partly chosen for this groundbreaking flight for her appealing looks, but also as a career woman and an athlete who offered a seriousness to the role. Kristen Lubin argues that Earhart, quote, was a potent symbol of radically shifting cultural and stylistic ideals. And photographs of the iconic aviator with tousled hair, leather jacket, and silk scarf were tangible manifestations of that symbol and the means through which it was disseminated. Earhart, through her carefully constructed self-image of a powerful woman, quickly captured the imagination of the public. She became a media sensation. Yet it was, states Lubin, Quote, her profession that endowed her with this aura of excitement, advancement, and risk. To be daring and adventuresome, to put home and family aside in favor of one's passion, was part of her seductive appeal to audiences, and especially other women. In this way, she may have shared a common esprit de corps with Lorene Squire, whose trips into the bush were perhaps not as exciting and risky as flying across an ocean, but were certainly daring for her day. Squire's travels to the north would be considered intrepid and adventurous even today. She not only spent several months in 1937 crossing the northern prairie provinces by canoe, by plane, and by train, 
but the next year saw her travel, travel to Richards Island in the Eastern Arctic, to North Battleford, Saskatchewan, then to Churchill, where she boarded the HBC ship, the Nascope, and headed north to Fort Ross, Baffin Island, and Greenland. As the Beaver was to put it in the 1938 December issue, and I quote, only a few mounted police and Hudson's Bay men have ever covered both Western and Eastern Arctic in one year. No camera artist and no woman has ever done it before. While this claim must be taken with a large pinch of salt, or at the very least acknowledged as the piece of colonialist paternalism that it is, after all, what they really mean is white woman, Nevertheless, the support that Squire received at the Beaver and throughout the North demonstrates that her art was deeply appreciated, regardless or maybe because of her girlhood. Lorene Squire died on the 13th of April, 1942. She was traveling by car with John Joseph Matthews, writer, historian, and tribal leader from the Osage Nation of Oklahoma, and Mrs. Elizabeth Hunt of Powhuska, Oklahoma, who had later become Matthews' wife. Squire and Matthews were to have written an article for Life magazine on the prairie chicken in Oklahoma. Squire was in the back seat when the car went off the road and onto a soft shoulder. She ended up with a crushed pelvis and died in hospital. She was 34 years old. At the time of her death, Squire was excitedly planning her next trips to the north to photograph a BC winter and to visit the whales at Tadoussac, the mouth of the St. Lawrence. Her career was exploding. In a short letter dated the 8th of April, just days before her death, sent to Cliff Wilson, the Beaver editor, and based on her letters, a great friend, she describes some tensions between herself and the Saturday Evening Post over the exclusive rights of her Beaver pictures, and her frustrations with the business of publishing, including the terrible reproductions of three of her shots in the New York Times. She grumbles, have never had so much trouble taken from my shoulders as what can be done when pictures being all settled. Telling Cliff that she was off to shoot some prairie chickens the next day, she signs off, again, we'll write further on my return. Sincerely, Loreen. After her death, her images would be reused again and again in the pages of the Beaver, as well as in the Moccasin Telegraph, a regional magazine also published out of the HBC Winnipeg office. But none of her self-portraits would be seen again, except in her obituaries, and in the archives. Squire sadly faded from memory and history. This may have to do with her specialty as a wildfowl photographer, a genre that has not been historically or critically explored in much depth. But perhaps some part of her disappearance may also be related to the changing attitudes towards the modern girl professional. To my contemporary eyes, there's a combination of naivety and earnestness and a somewhat embarrassing genuflection towards the consumer gaze in many of these images. It may be that aside from her early death, researchers have been put off by the rhetoric of the girl photographer. Yet Squire's identity as a wildfowl photographer and an artist must be reconciled with her public image as a modern girl to fully appreciate what an unusual figure she must have presented. At a time when few women pro photographers were professionally successful, let alone considered one of the nation's leading photographers of migratory wildfowl, whose work was exhibited in London, New York, and the pages of the New York Times, the Saturday Evening Post, Life, and most importantly, the Beaver Magazine. Thank you.